This is Amhara Media Corporation Hubbard Channel and you are watching our Thursday update live from Baharada, Ethiopia and Nayan Spread Desert. Stay with us. The Joint Ministerial Committee set to facilitate humanitarian, basic and public services for Northern Ethiopia has evaluated the performance of activities carried out in providing humanitarian aid, restoring basic services and reconstruction efforts for Northern Ethiopia. Modo Muluye will give us the details. In its report, the committee revealed that more than 85,000 metric tons of food were delivered by partner organizations, and the government delivered 14,000 metric tons of food since December 5, 2022. In addition, nutritious food, emergency shelters, non-food items, wash, education and protection materials, and more than 690,000 liters of fuel were delivered. Also, it was learned that 576 million birr was provided by non-governmental partner organizations and the government. Until now, some 85% of transmission line test and repair work has been undertaken in the war-affected areas. Activities are underway to finalize the remaining work in the coming two months. Currently, Makale, Alamata, Mahoni, Adigrat, Wukro, Abiyadi, Shura and Humara power stations are interconnected with the national grid to get power. After the finalization of the repair workers as soon as possible, Aksum, Weldia and Adwa power stations will go operational. On the other hand, 825 km optical line out of the 1,800 km planned to be repaired has so far been completed. According to the report, telecommunication service has started in 22 towns. In addition, networking that enables banks in other commercial activities has been finalized in Shura, Ndabaguna, Maizabri, Salaklaka, Aksum, Adwa, Alamata, and Koram. Besides, health supplies worth over 1.2 billion birr have been distributed. More than 6.9 people in Amhara, a far integral regions, need emergency food and non-food items. According to the Ethiopian Investment Commission, Ethiopia is working to secure more foreign direct investment in flows this Ethiopian fiscal year as the investment environment has become conducive for investors, Ababa Rahane reports. Following a high-level dialogue workshop held to strengthen investment partnership between Ethiopian Investment Commission and Development Partners yesterday, Deputy Commissioner Daniel Teresa told Ethiopian News Agency that the role of the Commission is to support investors engaging in Ethiopia. According to him, Ethiopian Investment Commission has huge responsibility of supporting investors to engage in import substitution in areas that create jobs among others. He stated that they have been working with development partners for years and this workshop is targeted to strengthen the relationship. Erwood learned that the workshop mainly focused on strengthening relations that are already established and to attract and work with other partners that have not been engaged in Ethiopia. The Deputy Commissioner said that improving investment environment, supporting investment activities, resolving gaps in the sector are among the main activities to be undertaken, stating that promoting Ethiopia's investment opportunities to partners is vital. He added that the peace deal between the governments of Ethiopia and the TPLF will also play a crucial role in attracting more investors to engage in Ethiopia in various sectors. He said that various efforts are undertaken to gain more foreign direct investment inflow in this Ethiopian fiscal year as compared to last year since working in partnership with various actors is pivotal to achieve the goals. Ethiopia has attracted 3 billion US dollar in foreign direct investment last Ethiopian fiscal year. President Sahala Rakhzodeh said women's participation in peace processes is way too low despite the compelling evidence that their participation in peace negotiations increased the probability of a peace agreement. 
by up to 35% more than if they were out of the process. Let's get more from the report. The third African Forum on Women, Peace and Security under the team leveraging on women, peace and security to enhance women's participation and leadership in peace process in Africa kicked off in Addis Ababa on December 14. President Sahalwar Zaude noted women are seen as victims and victims they are, adding that they are not, however, laminating at what happens to them. They are agents of peace, mediators, and negotiators. Citing the United Nations Women's Global Study on the Implementation of United Nations Security Council 1325, the Women in Peace and Security Agenda, she said that women constituted only 13% of negotiators of those 3% were involved in mediation and just 4% were signatories in major peace processes. Sahal Ork said that the world is experiencing a reversal of generational gain in women's rights while violence, conflict, coup d'etat, displacement and hunger continue to increase and she calls that a sad reality. Our demands and actions are for women to have their place in these peace processes, mediation, negotiations and implementation. Without their perspective, we cannot expect a lasting peace. African Union Commission Special Envoy on Women and Peace and Security, Benetta Diop, said on her part that women play an important role in preventing and de-escalating conflict, brokering local ceasefire, promoting culture of peace and coexistence, as well as recruitment of children as combatants. The African Union Commission Special Envoy said, yet the numbers show that investment in women and girls and willingness to ensure the involvement in this peace-building effort is desperately low adding that women represent tiny segment of peace negotiators, envoys, mediators and peacekeeping. She said they need to look into the role of women in post-conflict economic revitalization that brings them more equitable recovery. The two-day forum is expected to deliberate on the role of mediators in promoting women's meaningful participation in peace processes, promoting women's leadership in humanitarian action and promoting women's rights through electoral mediation. African women Women leaders, women peace builders, national and regional focal points on women peace and security, and other stakeholders in the implementation of the WPS Women Peace and Security Agenda in Africa are in attendance of the forum. The World Bank disclosed that vulnerable Ethiopians will benefit from 745 million US dollar in grants from improved access to health service and flood management projects. Brahan work and I will give us the detail. The World Bank, in its press release issued on December 15, stated that Ethiopians have been impacted by multiple crises, including COVID-19, climate-related disasters, and conflict in recent years, disrupting the delivery of essential health services, undermining the progress in health outcomes and service delivery achieved over the past decade. According to the statement, nearly 24 million people in conflict-affected areas are without access to adequate health services. In recent years, flood events in Ethiopia have significantly increased in magnitude, frequency and intensity. In 2020 alone, floods affected nearly 1 million Ethiopians and displaced nearly 300,000 and caused 288 fatalities, it stated. Adding, in the same year, Ethiopia lost nearly 358 million US dollars in damage to property, infrastructure and cropland, according to a recent assessment conducted by the World Bank. The impact of floods on agriculture and livestock has aggravated the already serious humanitarian situation. It said, unless swiftly addressed, these developments will continue to undermine economic and social development. To support Ethiopia's people as they face ongoing challenges, the World Bank Group has adopted a more people-centered approach to its program in Ethiopia with a strong focus on meeting basic needs and providing basic services to the vulnerable. Accordingly, the World Bank Group's Board of Executive Directors yesterday approved two projectors. The Ethiopia Program for Results for Strengthening Primary Health Care Services Project financed through a $400 million grant from the International Development Association and $45 million grant from the Global Financing Facility aims to improve essential and equitable health care services 
such as key reproductive, maternal and child health as well as nutrition services nationwide for the people of Ethiopia, including in conflict affected areas and especially for women and children who are the most vulnerable. The implementation of the project in conflict affected areas will be conducted through a third party implementing agency with proven access into these hot spotters. World Bank Group Country Director for Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan and Sudan, Osmani Dione said the health project will provide over 22 million women and children, including those in conflict affected areas and internally displaced persons, life saving health services such as immunization, family planning, skilled births, antenatal and postnatal care. It will also restore facilities that were damaged by conflict, enabling millions of Ethiopians to get access once again to the services they dearly need. He added that the flood management project financed by a 300 million US dollar grant from the International Development Association is geared towards urgently enhancing Ethiopia's resilience to climate-related shockers as well as improve its ability to better respond to and manage disasters and flood risks. The investment in flood management is part of our effort to protect vulnerable communities and boost their long-term resilience to climate-related risks. Peter D. Elias, practice manager for the World Bank's Urban Resilience and Land Global Practice. Specifically, the project aims to increase the resilience of communities and mitigate the catastrophic impact of floods on their livelihood by building the capacity of institutions and improving their ability to deliver quality services. Additionally, the project seeks to improve the quality of hydrological and meteorological services and improve flood early warning systems. Nearly 34 million people living in poor communities in the priority business of Awash, Omo and Rift Valley Lake business are expected to benefit from flood management project. According to the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia, the United States Agency for International Development has launched biodiversity and community resilience in the Omo Valley. A new 8.7 million US dollar project in the South Omo zone of the Southern Nations, Nationalities and Peoples regions, Mudomluye has a detail. The US Embassy in Ethiopia stated that over the next five years, the project will improve biodiversity, livelihoods and human rights in Ethiopia's lower Omo zone through community-based conservation, ecotourism, livestock production and political advocacy training. The activity will be implemented in partnership with the local government and members of the community living between the Omo National Park and the Margo National Park. The embassy stated that this land is being considered for the establishment of a new conservation trust, the Tana Community Conservation Area. You say this approach of focusing on both the biodiversity and the people of the Omo Valley recognizes the crucial role of communities as stewards of their own ecosystems. The new activity will directly benefit over 2,000 square kilometers of the Tama Community Conservation Area and will engage over 400 households in employment in the conservation area programs in administration, including work in ecotourism lodges, local craft production and sales, and tourism experiences. A benefit-sharing system will be established for those 13,500 residents of the area not directly involved. According to the embassy, this new project is another example of the cooperation between the American people and the Ethiopian people. This is Amhara Media Corporation Haber Channel and you're watching our daily update. Proceeding to news beyond borders. Worst floods in years battered Democratic Republic of Congo's main city following an all-night downpour, with government announcing three days of national mourning. A government document seen by the Reuters news agency showed at least 120 people have been killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo capital Kinshasa after heavy rains unleashed floods and caused landslides. 
Entire neighborhood was flooded with muddy water and houses and roads were ripped apart by sinkholes on Tuesday, including the N1 highway that connects Kinshasa to the chief seaport of Matade. The Prime Minister's office said in a statement that the N1 could be closed for three to four days and health minister the country told Reuters it had counted 141 dead but that the number needed to be cross-checked with other departments. Sudan has signed an initial six billion US dollar deal led by United Arab Emirates AD Ports Group and Invictus Investment to build a vast new Red Sea port and economic zone. During the signing ceremony on Tuesday, Sudan's finance minister Jibril Ibrahim said the project will give a strong boost to the national economy and will bring countless benefits for the whole country. Ibrahim said the Abu Amama port, which is going to be built north of the existing key hub of Port Sudan, will include an industrial zone, an international airport, and an agricultural area covering over 400,000 acres. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame, who is in Washington for U.S.-Africa summit, distances his country from mounting bloodshed in Democratic Republic of Congo's East disavowed any link to actions of M23 rebels there. Brown Workner will give us the detail. Rwandan President Paul Kagame has shrugged off a soaring day's toll in the Democratic Republic of Congo's East, distancing his nation from mounting bloodshed on Rwanda's doorstep. Kagame told an audience of sites from the U.S. Africa Summit in Washington on Wednesday. A preliminary investigation by the U.N. mission in Democratic Republic Congo found that 131 men, women and children were shot dead or hacked to death late last month as part of reprisals against the civilian population by M23 rebels. The insurgency is widely believed to be armed and supported by Rwanda, but Kagame disavowed any link to the group's actions. Fighting in the eastern North Cable region has aggravated already tense relations between Democratic Republic Congo and Rwanda. Kinshasa expelled the Rwandan ambassador on October 29. Democratic Republic Congo President Flex Shadi said on Tuesday, in a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antonio Blinken that his country was a victim of an aggression which is hidden, but it is from Rwanda and this has been destabilizing. The United Nations top representative for the conflict told the Security Council last week the M23 army group is to blame for a security situation beginning October 20 that has deteriorated dramatically. An estimated additional 370,000 people have been uprooted and forced from their homes in the latest round of hostilities involving the M23, Benoto Keta said. This is Amhara Media Corporation Hubbard Channel and you are watching our Thursday update live from Bahar Dari TV. And now let's see the foreign currency exchange rate of the day. This is all we got for today. I am Fikrat Dizodo and you are watching our daily update live from Bahar Dari Ethiopia. Goodbye and have a nice day.